Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library, and we're really excited to have Janet Skeslian, no, did I say it right? <laughs> Charles here to, Janet Skeslian Charles here to talk about her book that came out yesterday, The Paris Library. Is that right, too? <laughs> um, and I'll uh, we'll get to more about that in just a minute, but I just want to do, um, talk a little bit about the process of this meeting. So we are recording it and we are live on Facebook so people can ask questions here or there. And um, I would ask you put questions in, your, in the chat which I will moderate after Janet's presentation. Um, we always like to thank the Library Foundation, the Cary Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programs. We could not do these kind of things without them. And um, I would like to let you know that you can buy signed books from Bank Square Books. Janet sent them book plates. And um, is, for anybody who knows me, you all know that I love signed books. I think they're gold. So uh, I will put the link to that in the chat as we go. And um, also I wanted to let you know that we now have captions for our program. So you are more than welcome to enable that down at the bottom with live transcript or up at the top if you want a pop out window with Otter. I will um, put instructions for that in the chat as well. Um, <clears throat> if you have any tech issues or comments, please put them in the, in the, com in the chat. I will be monitoring that as well. And we, like I said, we are live streaming on Facebook so people can ask questions there. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Janet Skeslian Charles. I feel like I'm saying that wrong, Janet. <laughs> no? Okay, good. Um, so Janet is an award-winning author of Moonlight in Odessa. Her shorter work has appeared in reviews such as Splice and Monta Montana Noir. She learned about the history of American Library in Paris while working there as a programs manager, so she knows what she's talking about. She divides her time between Montana and Paris, and as I said, we are celebrating her book birthday of the Paris Library that just came out yesterday. And it is, um, you know, as a librarian, I have to say that I love hearing any story where a librarian is a hero, which I think of course we are. <laughs> so Janet, please tell us all about your book. Welcome to Cary Library. And, um, and I can't wait to hear this. Oh, well, thank you, Mina, for having me. Well, bonjour de Paris. Hello from Paris. And uh, many thanks to Mina at the Cary Library for inviting me today. I'm thrilled to be here with you. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my novel, The Paris Library. It's World War II. Paris is occupied. There's a war on words. It's Nazis versus American librarians. And the librarians win. The Paris Library tells the true tale of the courageous librarians who defied the Nazis in order to deliver books to Jewish readers. I first learned about the story when I worked at the American Library in Paris as the program's manager. Like Mina, I organized author events and oversaw the ALP's weekly Evening with an Author series, hosting journalists, debut novelists, and national award book winners. At events, I stood in the back of the reading room, one eye on the crowd, the other on my journal, as I noted down the writer's words. It was a pleasure to meet the authors. I learned so much from each one. During the day at my desk in the busy back office, I also took note of what colleagues said, and I was particularly captivated by the World War II story of the library. I grew up in a small town in Montana near the Canadian border. Glimpses of the outside world came from my neighbor, a war bride from France, as well as from my grandmother's jigsaw puzzles with their images of French castles. Each week, my mother drove my grandmother, who never learned to drive, to the grocery store and the library. From these treks, I understood that books were as important as food and that the library was the window to the world. When I got a job at the American Library, a dream came true. The American Library in Paris is born of war. In 1917, when the U.S. entered World War I, the, library Amer the American Library Association distributed two million books to soldiers in camp libraries and hospitals. The Paris Library, as it was called then, was just a depot for books, but readers in Paris wanted to create a more permanent library. 
1920, the American Library in Paris's collection began with the books that Canadian and American citizens sent to their soldiers in France through the ALA's war service. Among the first trustees of the library were the writer Edith Wharton, the millionaire Anne Morgan, and the countess from Ohio, Claire de Chambrun. The ALP was founded from the royalties from books, books of poetry by Alan Seeger, a Harvard grad and a soldier poet who was killed in World War I. Charles Seeger created the library as a living monument to his son. Many of us have read the poetry of Alan Seeger. His poem, I Have a Rendezvous with Death, has been widely anthologized, and it was a particular favorite of President John F. Kennedy. Reading is my passion. I can't imagine not having access to books. And yet this is exactly what happened to Jewish readers in France during World War II. During the Nazi occupation, Jewish people were stripped of their rights. They could no longer work in many professions. They could no longer take certain classes at university. They could no longer enter parks or even libraries. Now we know that they were in tremendous danger. One quarter of France's Jewish population was killed in the war. But at the time, librarians reached out to Jewish readers to make sure that they remained a part of the community. I wanted to write about the courage of these Parisians. In order to learn more, I read letters from staff members who worked through the occupation and interviewed people who lived through the occupation. At the Bibliothèque Nationale, France's national library, I devoured memoirs by women, for example, from foreign journalists to a Parisian madam who explained that her Nazi clientele was perfectly correct in their behavior, to a gutsy American wife who followed her French husband from their luxurious Parisian apartment to the army, ba to the army base where he was drafted. When you research World War II, every detail feels important. The letters, the news clippings, the journal entries are so fascinating that you wish you could include every single person, every single moment in your book. And today I'm thrilled to be able to share some of the behind the scenes photos and stories of the librarians who are featured in my book, The Paris Library. First, I'd like to tell you about my favorite, Dorothy Reader. Isn't that a great name for a librarian? After working at the Library of Congress, she came to Paris alone in 1929. She got a, she got a job in the, in the periodical section of the American Library in Paris. And by 1936, she had worked her way up to the role of directress. After the war, she raised awareness and funds for the Red Cross in Florida. She then spent two years in Bogota, Colombia, where she trained librarians. In the 1940s, Dorothy Reeder worked on three continents. She is simply amazing. Second, the head librarian Boris Nechayev is originally from Russia. When he was only 15, he lied about his age so that he could enroll in the army and fight in the Russian Revolution. When it was over, he and his brother moved to France, hoping for peace, but instead found themselves in the middle of another war. Third, the Countess from Ohio, Clara de Chambrun. She was an American who married a French count. As I mentioned earlier, she was one of the first trustees of the library. During World War II, the Countess was 70 years old. She was so worried about the library that she spent many nights there, sleeping on a mattress in order to keep watch. Dorothy Reeder, Boris Nechayev, and the Countess Claire Chambrun were the life, heart, and soul of the library. And I hope that you'll enjoy hearing a little bit more about their stories in my book. In the summer of 1939, librarians, like all Parisians, carried gas masks. To prepare for war, the librarians pasted brown strips of paper on windows as protection against shattered glass in case of bombings. The US Embassy advised Americans to leave France. Dorothy Reeder and her staff remained. Three days after war was declared in September of 1939, the directress created the soldier service in order to send books to French and English soldiers. She and her staff sent books to military hospitals and canteens, but Miss Reeder's point of pride was the care packages sent to individual soldiers. These soldiers wrote to the library 
asking for whatever books they wanted, maybe English, maybe French, maybe mysteries, maybe Westerns or, or biographies or magazines such as National Geographic. A few of the men even wrote, for young, wrote asking for young female pen pals. From September 1939 to May 1940, the library sent 100,000 books to soldiers. In June of 1940, when the Nazis got close to Paris, most people fled. Dorothy Reader remained. She, she organized transportation for her staff and they traveled west to the city of Angoulême. However, the directors remained at her beloved library. In a report marked confidential, she described the early days of the occupation. Was it really Paris whose streets I walked through? I do not think so, she wrote. It was a dead city. Everything was closed, locked, deserted. Even the fall of a pin could be heard. Unfortunately, the Germans' reach soon extended west. So the library staff returned from Angoulême to Paris. It was then that they learned that the Nazis had pillaged the Polish library, which sits in the shadow of Notre Dame. The Nazis also stole the collection of the Russian library, then the Ukrainian library. They even abducted the, the librarian. So you can understand why the staff at the American Library in Paris was nervous. Sure enough, the Nazis arrived. Hermann Fuchs, the Bibliothèque Schutz, or library protector, had full authority over intellectual activity in the country at the time. He arrived to inspect the library. All the directors saw was a man in a Nazi uniform, but Dr. Fuchs recognized Dorothy Reeder immediately. Before the war, these two book lovers had chatted at international library conferences, but now they found themselves on opposing sides of the war. Dr. Fuchs chatted cordially with the directors for a little while, but then he announced certain people may not enter, meaning Jewish people. Dorothy Reeder then conferred with the Countess. They decided that if readers could not visit the library, well, then the librarians would visit them. This was not without danger. Boris, the head librarian, was shot by the Gestapo and taken to be interrogated. Without the quick intervention of the Countess, Boris would have died. I interviewed Boris's daughter, who was in the next room when he was shot through the lung. Helen said that Boris made a full recovery. He went on to smoke packs of his beloved Gitan cigarettes and worked at the library until he retired. I've got a few, um, one of my favorite parts of writing this book was the research and I'd love to show you a few photos now. So I'm gonna to try to screen share and hope for the best. So here we have the cover of my book, The Paris Library. Hmm. Let's see, excuse me. And here we are in the American Library of Paris. It is the largest English language library on the European continent with 4,000 members representing 60 countries. It celebrated its centennial in 2020. 22% of the members are French. In its current location, the American Library sits in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. This photo was taken on my first day at work as the programs manager. And as you might imagine, I had to pinch myself because I couldn't quite believe it was true. This photo is not of the, of the general um, entrance of the library. This is the, this is the staff entrance and it, you go through a secret courtyard to get to the entrance. This is the library in 1939. Staff comes from the US, Canada, Russia, France, Switzerland, and England. Our story starts here. This is an information card about the library. As you can see, 
there are only four digits in the telephone number. This photo is one that I bought online. I became an obsessive Googler as I was uh, researching this book. So every few days I would put in key things like the American Library in Paris, Dorothy Reader, uh, Claire de Chambrun, Boris Nechayev, hoping to find photos or documents about them. This is, this is the photo of the courtyard of the library in 1936. In August of 1939, war is on the way. The US ambassador advised, in view of the situation prevailing in Europe, it is advisable that American citizens return to the States. Here, Miss Reader and the Canadian librarian, Mrs. Turnbull, are putting important documents and books in the safe. In September of 1939, three days after war was declared, this reader created the soldier service and books were shipped to English, French, Czech soldiers, as well as to the French Foreign Legion. She declared, no other thing possesses that mystical faculty to make people see with other people's eyes. The library is a bridge of books between cultures. From May 1939 to May, to May 1940, a total of 100,000 books were sent. One thing I learned when researching this book was that, they, that li the librarians did not have caddies with wheels like we see today. They had these baskets and they must have been very heavy to carry. Here we see that the Nazi have arrived in Paris in June of 1940. This is one of my favorite photos of Miss Reader, and I found this photo on eBay for $24.99. It is one of the best purchases of my life and it would have been at any price. I had, this, I had this photo on my desk for several years as I was writing her story. So we see some of the same information here on June 12, 1940, just before the Nazis invaded Paris, Miss Reader sent her staff away for, for their own safety. She remained at her post. It was there that she dealt with Dr. Fuchs, the Nazi library protector. She and her staff delivered books to Jewish members. This is another photo of the directress. I think she looks a little different in every single photo I've seen of her. You can see in, uh, on her wall, that's a photo of Washington DC where she is from. I absolutely love that big telephone and I'm surprised at how small telephones have gotten in between times. She and the Countess Claire de Chambrun kept the library open during World War II. Here we have a photo of, of the Countess. As I said, she was one of the original trustees. During World War II, she was the only trustee to remain in Paris. The others returned to the safety of the States. She too had her difficulties with Dr. Fuchs. She was summoned to his office because the, the American Library had been denounced for, because its collection contained anti-German journals and political cartoons. This is a photo that I found online as well and purchased. I think this one is off of Amazon. It's a photo of her home, in the, um, which is just right across the street from the Luxembourg Garden. She too was an exceptional woman. She earned her PhD from the Sorbonne at the age of 48. She was a Shakespeare scholar as well as a novelist. She and Hemingway shared a publisher, Scribner. She also translated Shakespeare's work into French. You can read about her war experiences in her memoir, Shadows and Sun. This is a photo of Boris. And what's interesting about Boris, the Countess, and the Directress is that I am not on a first name basis with the Countess or the Directress. And no one at the library, not the director today, not the assistant director, are on a first name basis with them. But we all call Boris, Boris. We're all on a first name basis with Boris. I don't know what the difference is. But here we have Boris standing in front of the library with his daughter, Helen. I was thrilled to be able to interview her for this book. She was in her 80s at the time. So Boris Nechayev started at the library as a page and he worked his way up to head librarian. He was originally from Russia and he spoke several languages. His nanny was in English, so he spoke English impeccably. During the occupation, he was shot by the Gestapo and he was also taken prisoner. He survived and worked at the library until he retired. 
Here is a staff photo, and I'll point out how cool Paris is usually, a, uh, it's a photography studio where all of the big stars have been photographed. Even today, the biggest stars in the world uh, go to their studio to be photographed. Here we have the directress, um, where she looks a, a little different in, in the photo again. Here we have Boris. This is really a wonderful story, and I wish I could have included more of it in the book. Um, in the first row, we have Mrs. Turnbull, who, uh, Evangeline Turnbull, who was the cataloger. And in the second row, we have her daughter, Olivia. So don't you just love the idea of a mother-daughter team working at a library? I just, I'm so enchanted by it. So these two ladies worked at the, worked at the library until June of 1940. They were Canadian and thus British citizens, and they were in danger of being arrested as, as enemy aliens. So they returned to the safety of Canada. When I was reaching, researching the Turnbulls, I learned that Evangeline had been married to a young man. They married right before World War I, right before he shipped off to France, where he was killed. So this family had three family members, and all three of them had been in France during a world war. This is the library love story. Here we have uh, Helen Fickweiler, and Peter Ustinov. When I heard the name Peter Ustinov, I thought at first it might be the actor, but no. These two fell in love. Helen, Helen Fickweiler arrived at the library in France three weeks before war broke out. And as with all the Americans, they were, it was recommended that they return home, but they stayed at the library. And when they returned home, Helen and Peter eventually married. I was, I was able to correspond with their daughter and granddaughter, and it was very interesting to learn about, about their lives. It was also uh, a great help to, to be in contact with their daughter because their daughter was able to help the library identify some people in archive photos. This is the library book plate from the darkness of war, the light of books. So you can see, um, you can still see the legacy of war because the book is opened like a horizon with the sun and the book is almost conquering the sword and, and, and the gun is hiding them or, or, or covering them. So here we are um, back at the Paris library. I hope you enjoyed seeing some of the pictures. So my novel is set in Paris and in Montana where I grew up. But how did a small town girl from Montana end up in Paris? I'd like to tell you a little bit about the inspiration behind my interest in France. In Shelby, population 2000, my parents are retired farmers and we were landlocked by wheat fields. When I was younger, I was dying to get to the big noisy city where I could be anonymous and no one would know my business. I had a lot in common with my character, Lily, who at the time felt like she was living reruns of Little House on the Prairie while everyone else was watching MTV. Now mm -hmm. I miss Montana, the calm, the silence, the quiet beauty, the way people care for each other, the exact reasons I wanted to leave. I didn't always realize what I had. Now I miss the prairie. The land is so flat that you can see a hundred miles in any direction, and it gives you a sense of limitless possibilities. I wish I'd appreciated things a bit more, and maybe these days we all see things a little bit differently. In Shelby, our neighbor was a war bride. Claudine was originally from the city of Rouen, not far from the D-Day beaches in Normandy. She married a GI and traveled with him to the States. When Claudine spoke, she made English sound so beautiful with her lilting accent. I loved listening to her. And she made me want to write about a war bride. Even as a child, I understood that she was incredibly brave to leave behind her friends, her family, her country, and even her language behind. Spending time with her made me want to learn French and go to France. I first became an exchange student as a teen and then later got a job uh, as a teaching assistant here in France. When I was 28 years old, I signed a one-year teaching contract in a local high school in France. 
On my first day here at Charles de Gaulle Airport, I met my husband. I kept renewing my work contract until we got married. And then I guess that's a long-term contract, isn't it? In terms of things that I'm interested in writing about, it's maybe the shock of cultures and not so much European versus American, but small town versus big city. My character Odile, who moved to Freud, Montana, to be with her GI husband, did not have an easy time of it in a small town, just like my neighbor Claudine struggled with homesickness and having to recreate her identity. In Rouen, she'd been a teacher, but in Montana, her degree wasn't acknowledged, so she worked as a secretary in the school. Likewise, my American teaching degree wasn't recognized in France, so I had to ask myself, if I'm not a teacher, who am I? I have to rewrite my future. I've written novels about email order brides and war brides. I'm interested in journeys. I'm interested in women who are on their own, whether it is through isolation, divorce, widowhood, or travel. They must make sense of big changes in their lives. Of course, this novel is a love letter to libraries and bookstores and to librarians and booksellers who promote reading and understanding. And it's a reminder in our digital age that our libraries, our third space, our sanctuary, our source of facts in the fake news world are more vital than ever. The Paris Library is a reminder that we must protect what we have. This has been a difficult time for most of us, and I hope that reading will bring solace. I hope that reading will bring us together. Dorothy Reader said that books are bridges, and I believe that with my whole heart. Finally, I'd like to thank Mina and the Cary Library again, as well as everyone at Simon & Schuster for their encouragement and support. And thank you for your attention. I'm sorry we couldn't meet in person, but I hope that you'll check out my novel and that you'll enjoy spending time in the Paris Library. Wow, thank you so much, Janet. Um, we have time for questions, of course, but I have to say that um, <laughs> if I could get my daughter to work in a library, I would totally do. <laughs> have him in the Paris Library. Um, and you obviously had my, um, you know, the job that I would have loved to have. So um, as a programs person at the Paris Library with that, what was it, the, the, the secret court? That's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so I, I might have missed this, but did you talk about how did you find Miss Reader? How did you um, initially find her and, or, and, and create the story around her? Uh, when I was working, well, I should say that I arrived in Paris in 2000 and I became a member of the library. I volunteered at the library, but it wasn't until I worked at the library that I heard the story. Two colleagues told me about this story. So when I was in the, in the back office, uh, two of the colleagues were talking about it. And this is how I, this is how I learned the story. One of them uh, has been working at the library since the Nixon administration. So he's been there quite a long time. He's Italian and uh, he's very reserved and he knows everything, but he will never volunteer any information. So you really have to pull it out of him. And I had another colleague who has a, a degree in museums and uh, she put together a wonderful display of librarians during and after the war. And believe it or not, the time just after the war was even more difficult in some ways. Okay. Um. <laughs> For some reason, my computer just acted really weird. But um, Teresa asked, what was the best piece of writing advice that you've gotten and that you still use? The best piece of writing advice that I've gotten and still use came from a writing workshop that I led. One of my students was actually a veteran writer. His name was Bob Levy. And I have to say that a lot of my sentences when I started writing just kind of petered out. And so Bob said that you should end on the strongest image or word and um, for your chapters, for your paragraphs and for your sentences. So he suggested having a, really have a, a strong ending for every, every sentence or every paragraph or every chapter. And I really pay attention on the sentence level and try to follow his advice because I think, I think it's quite good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so when she started the research for this book, um, 
what was there anything that really captured you about the story that that you were like aha that's I have to write about that particular thing there um there was a 15 page report that Dorothy Reader had written about the occupation and uh I read that report it's um I actually put it on my website because I thought it was so fascinating and so when I read her 15 pages of her experience of the occupation, dealing with Dr. Fuchs, being separated from her family, and, and just basically how the Germans squeezed the life out of them. Um, I, it, it gave me chills because she wrote so lucidly about it that I just wanted every single person to read that confidential report. Mm -hmm. Well, um... I do have to say librarians are really good at um, mm -hmm. keeping records. <laughs> um, Kelly would at, like to know what pro proportion of the book is fiction and is the World War II Nazi part actually all factual? Well, as I say in my author's note, there are two points that I changed. I condensed time between Dr. Fuchs's first visit to the library. Uh, I think uh, there was going from one scene to the next, it would have actually been about three months. And I, I shortened that time. And then um, when the Countess is summoned to the office of the Nazi library protector, I have my main character, who's a fictional character, go with the Countess. But in fact, it was the library secretary, Hilda Frickert. Oh, OK. Um, so what parts did you, I guess, to add on to that, how did you decide which parts you would keep, make, make add in as fictional and um, which parts you would keep as factual? Well, actually the, the facts are so interesting. There was no reason to change them. I mean, it really is an incredible story. These, you know, when, when the American ambassador tells everyone in, in every American in France to leave the country, most people followed his advice. All the trustees followed the ambassador's advice. They went home immediately. And here you have these librarians who stay because of their belief in books as bridges. So mm -hmm. the story in itself is, is, really, is really incredible. And uh, there's also a story of a young Jewish woman, if you want to read the story of a young Jewish woman uh, who lived during this time, it's the Journal of Ellen Baer. And so this is the real journal of a young woman during the occupation. And she herself was a librarian. She was a librarian at the Sorbonne. And, uh, it could be read as a companion piece to to my to my book, and you'll see you'll see what I've described is is exactly what she describes. It, it was a very difficult time, and yet these librarians were sustained by their love of books and their belief in the communion of books. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it, I guess that makes me wonder um, why you didn't write this as a, a nonfiction book. Because the the whole point of the book to me is the importance of transmission of stories. And I hope what readers take away from this story is we need to learn more about our families. We need to learn more about our neighbors and friends because we don't really know each other. I think we as a society have stopped listening to each other. We have so much to say that we're always moving forth, but we're not really taking in. And so my goal in writing this book was to show that we don't necessarily know people. Even if we know about them, we don't know about their rich interior lives. And so you'll see in, in the book, uh, Odile as an older war bride befriends a young woman. And you'll see how they help each other, how they listen to each other and how their stories entwine and how they give each other courage. And to me, that's the whole point of the book. Um, and without, without that Montana section, um, the story doesn't make any sense to me. I feel like the story is about transmission of stories, just like the librarians work so hard to share their love of books. Um, they share their love of stories and keeping people alive through stories and through memories. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite character, Heather asks? I like the character Margaret. Margaret's an English woman and she really struggles in Paris. My main character, Odile, who's fictional, really loves Paris. She was born in Paris. She feels at ease at Paris. She's never been worried or, or had any trouble in Paris. Whereas Margaret doesn't speak French. She doesn't have any friends. She really struggles. And so maybe I related a little bit to that struggle. And um, so I really enjoyed writing Margaret's point of view. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Miriam asks, how did the Jews communicate with the librarians to request items? That's a good question. They could they could call on the phone to request items or they could just send little notes. Um, the library actually burned all of its uh, all of its records because they were afraid of the of the Nazis getting a hold of addresses and telephone numbers or any information for people. Mm -hmm. So obviously they wanted to get books into the hands of um, people, but they also their top priority was safety. Yes. If they burned all of their records, what did you use as primary resources? My primary resources were the documents that were sent to the American Library Association. Dorothy Reeder uh, sent letters uh, quite often, uh, keeping people informed about what was going on. And so those letters remained in the archives of the American Library Association. So uh, I made a request to the ALA and they sent me hundreds of pages of documents. They, they scanned them and then sent them to me and I printed them off here. Wow. So that was that was really my one of the primary sources that I used. Mm -hmm. Just another, you know, nail in that librarians are awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I am a librarian. I have to like tout us. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> um, Trish wants to know the characters in the book talk about their favorite books and do a bit of book therapy. Um, oops, getting lots of questions here. What are some of your favorite books and what books would you recommend to people who are shut inside during the pandemic? Oh, that's such a good question. I love the book Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. It's one of my favorites. I've reread it several times. Just, I love the beauty of the language, but what I love most is how she shows disparate people in a very stressful situation. They are, um, they are stuck in a house together. They don't necessarily speak the lang same languages and yet they find ways to communicate and they find ways to become friends. And I just think it is one of the most beautiful stories that I've ever read. So I highly recommend that. Um, I do think the, I do think the journal of Ellen Baer, which is the story of a 20 year old, um, 20 year old Jew Jewish student who absolutely loved English and English literature is, is, a, is a really interesting story to read because we see what it was really like from someone who from someone who was there. It took me years to read the story because I knew what happened at the end and I just didn't want to get to the end. So I would just read a, a journal entry here and there and put it down for a month and then pick it up. But when you read what life and excitement and enthusiasm she had and her hopes and her, her crushes, um, her nicknames for people, it just is really in its, in its way life affirming. Thank you. Um... Sandra asks, did the librarians themselves deliver the books or were there others involved in the transport and return? The librarians went, the librarians went. So we have, um, we had the countess, we had the directress and we had Peter and Boris who went and delivered the books. Okay. Um, so they really kept it pretty tight so that information yes. couldn't be, you know, shared. Um, Miriam says, were the other libraries in other countries doing the same thing? That is such a good question. I have no information about that, but I will say I got a cute note from my Spanish translator who when they were in lockdown, uh, book lovers would contact their local booksellers and order books. And then the clients, the book lover would meet the, the bookseller in the vegetable, the, the vegetable aisle of the, of the grocery store and make transactions. So they did in Spain during this lockdown have their own clandestine um, way to get books. Um, well, we're, people are clever, you know, in difficult times, even in not difficult times. Um, Heather says, the quotes that you use in the book are just wonderful for any book nerd to embrace. Is there a favorite line from, from a favorite book that you find yourself using, quoting more frequently now? Well, it's not in the book, but I love Anais Nin's quote, um, we write to taste life twice. Because I'm a journaler and so I, I like to record what happens. And that's one of my that's one of my favorite quotes. And I also like um, I also like um, Zora Neale Hurston. I 
I used many of her quotes and just such beautiful, such beautiful, beautiful phrases. It's, she's just startling in her beauty. Mm -hmm. Did you always know that you were going to be a writer? Um, it sounds like you took kind of a path between teaching and you know program from it, programming events, things like that. But did you have like a sense that you would wanted to write books or write? I think I've always been a writer. Um, I think more recently I'm an author, but. Um, But I've, yes, I've always journaled. I've always been interested in writing. It's very hard because it's not like engineering school or um, maybe having a dental practice where you, you go through certain kind of schooling and you come out with a diploma um, or a, a certain knowledge of how, how it's done so or how to get published. It, um, so it, it did take time. It did take time. And I think the internet has made it a lot easier. Uh, the process isn't so mysterious now. but. Um, but yes, I've always loved writing. Is it easier or different to publish in France than it would be here in the US? I don't know. In France, I think it's hard because there are no agents. So people send directly to editors. So it's harder for the editors because they, they just have a huge, huge, huge slush pile. Um, but it's also a little harder for the for the for the writers because they don't know what's normal or they don't know what's not normal or what a contract looks like or what a contract could look like. So I don't think they, I don't think writers have the, 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 the protection. Um, I know a lot of writers that I know here have been told they're lucky to be published. Um, so, so it's a different, it's a different, um, it's a different point of view, but it is, it's, um, it's just, it's just different. I, I don't know if they, they don't have as many MFA programs, so maybe there's not as much competition either. I think in the United States, probably every university has an undergraduate writing program. Many of them have MFA programs. So that is just a huge amount of people wanting to write. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, Trish asks, what would have happened to the librarians if they had been caught? That's a good question. We don't really know. I think the I think a big danger would have been leading the leading the Nazis to a, a, a Jewish family that might have been in hiding or might have not wanted that attention. So I think it could have been dangerous for the librarians who um, have to go through all of these different barricades and explain themselves. And every time they go through one of these barricades, they take a risk um, and then for the Jewish people who are opening their door and taking a risk, making a phone call, bringing attention to themselves, it was very dangerous for them as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a dangerous time just in general, I think for anybody who is different, right? Um, yes. I have a question about um, your, original, your first book it was Moonlight in Odessa. And you had mentioned talking about sort of mail order brides and things like that. So one of the comments I read on your website was that your research is, so, is it's just so skillful and deep. How did you find, you know, research differently for the two, two books? Well, for email order brides, I have to say, Montana has a tradition of mail order brides. So I was familiar with these stories. And when I was at university studying Russian, I had a man who, who was corresponding with, with Russian women and he asked me to translate the letters. And so it was very interesting because his letters were very romantic. Do you like going to the movies? Do you like romantic walks? And her letters were very pragmatic. Do you earn enough money to take care of me and my son? Do you still live with your parents? So you can see right away that their concerns are quite different and their approach is quite different. And of course, at that time, he was looking at a catalog. Now it's on the internet where you're looking at photos. So even, even before I went to Odessa, Ukraine, where I lived for two years, I was, I was aware of this situation. Uh, when I lived in Odessa, Ukraine, I can say that I taught uh, English full time at a local high school and I earned $25 a month my rent was $100 a month. Hmm. And it was paid by, I, I worked for the Soros Foundation, so they covered my rent. But you can see how challenging it would have been for my colleagues uh, who, who did not have that luxury. So already I, I was working with these amazing, talented, cultivated, um, ambitious women who didn't have a, 
a future in their own country and who wanted to who wanted to escape and one of the ways to escape was to marry a total stranger so it's very it's a big it's a big risk it really is a big risk and in some ways it was just like the war brides and so there are some similarities as you can see in the two stories these leaps of faith that people take um these leaps of faith that people take. I will say for the e for the email order bride stories, I did a lot of research online. And if my husband had ever looked at my um, browser history, he would have thought that I was looking for a nice young lady named Yulia or Olga um, to, to, to bring over and to marry. So I'm very glad he never noticed too much what I was looking at. Um, I've talked to a lot of mystery authors who say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how to kill someone. <laughs> yes, okay. I feel better about my own research now. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, that was something that really stuck out to me in um in a lot of the comments about your your books is that your research is just spot on. And I, oh, you know, you. I think that being right in the library for this particular book probably was very helpful because you're in that atmosphere. Well, I, the biggest compliment I received on this book was from Boris's son, who had worked at the library as a teenager. Um, both of, the, both of the, the, his children spent a lot of time at the library, and he wrote that even though the book was 400 pages long, because I think he read it when it was 120,000 words, I think it's 100,000 words now. Uh, so it was 400 pages in, in a foreign language for him, it was in English, but he read it in four days and he said that I had captured the atmosphere of the library and the librarians. So I was really happy about that. And it just makes me want to cry. <laughs> because, you know, places have characters and, you know, they can be characters in a lot of, you know, books and that's something that we really look for. Um, so with that research, this is one of my favorite questions to others. Are you a pantser or are you a planner? Like, do you really plan out and, um, you know, outline or whatever your story is, or do you kind of go, once you have your research all together, do you kind of just write? I plan because I'm a control freak. And then at some point, um, my characters are become willful teenagers and just disobey. For example, for the first five drafts of, of this novel, Odile, my main character, died at the end. Mm. And um, somehow she lived. And so she really surprised me. I was glad. I mean, I, I was really glad, really glad. It was a good surprise. I was happy to have a happy ending, but that when I, that's not what I was writing towards and that's not what I expected. So I think it's good to have a plan or an idea of where you're going, but also to be flexible enough to let the characters have, have that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, your parents are here, I believe, and they can probably speak to if you also were a difficult teenager. But I won't put them on the spot. <laughs> Don't ask them. They will tell you. <laughs> I think I'm laughing. But uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you've had a really adventurous life. You talked about going to Ukraine and going to France and, you know, appreciating your roots and things like that. So that's really amazing, um, an amazing life in a short time. Um, Miriam wants to know, uh, where does the library, the, I assume the Paris Library, library's funding come from? The library funding, the library does not receive any federal funding from the United States or any state funding from France. And so the library has subscribers. It's a private library. So they have um, 4,000 members. And then of course they have people who donate or foundations that donate. Hmm. Um, we have just a few more minutes and I, want, I was wondering if you had mentioned that you might want to read a little bit from your book. Yes, it's a pleasure. I have to say, I don't know if you can see it, but look at the look at the gorgeous inside of the book. Isn't it beautiful? When my editor Trish sent me this end paper, I just about cried when I saw it. Um, hold on one second. Did you just freeze for everybody? It, no, you're okay. All right, keep going. Did did everyone hear what I said about? Did you see the end paper? Okay, thank you. I love it. People are nodding. Thank you, people. All right, well, we start with my main character, Odile, in, the, in, in Paris in February 1939. Numbers floated around my head like stars. Eight, two, three. The numbers were the key to my new life. Eight, two, two. Constellations of hope. Eight, four, one. In my bedroom late at night, in the morning on the way to get croissants, series after series. Eight, one, four. Eight, four, oh. 
890 formed in front of my eyes. They represented freedom, the future. Along with the numbers, I studied the history of libraries going back to the 1500s. In England, while Henry VIII was busy chopping off his wives' heads, our King Francois was modernizing his library, which he opened to scholars. His royal collection was the beginning of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Now, at the desk in my bedroom, I prepared for my job interview at the American Library in Paris. I reviewed my notes one last time, founded in 1920, the first in Paris to let the public into the stacks, subscribers from more than 30 countries, one fourth of them from France. I held fast to these facts and figures, hoping that they'd make me appear qualified to the directress. I strode from my family's apartment on the city route to Rome, across from the San Lazar train station, where locomotives coughed up smoke. The wind whipped my hair, and I tucked tendrils under my tam hat. In the distance, I could see the ebony dome of St. Augustine Church. Religion 200, Old Testament 221. What was the New Testament? I waited, but the numbers wouldn't come. I was so nervous that I forgot simple facts. I drew my notebook from my purse. Ah, oh, yes, 225. I knew that. My favorite part of library school had been the Dewey Decimal System, conceived in, 1830, in 1873 by the American librarian Melvin Dewey. It used 10 classes to organize library books based on subject. There was a number for everything, allowing any reader to find any book in any library. For example, Mama took pride in her 648 housekeeping. Papa wouldn't admit it, but he really did enjoy 785 chamber music. My twin brother was more of a 636.8 person, while I preferred 636.7, cats and dogs, respectively. I arrived on the Grand Boulevard, where in the space of a block, the city shrugged off her working class mantle and donned a mink coat. The coarse smell of coal dissipated, replaced by the honeyed jasmine of joy, worn by women delighting in the window display of Nina Ritchie's dresses and Kislov's green leather gloves. Farther along, I wound around musicians, exiting the shop that sold wrinkled sheet music, past the Baroque building with the blue door, and turned the corner onto a narrow street. I knew the way by heart. I loved Paris, the city of Paris. Like book covers, some leather, some cloth, each Parisian door led to an unexpected world. A courtyard could contain a knot of bicycles or a plump concierge armed with a broom. In the case of the library, the massive wooden door opened to a secret garden. Bordered by petunias on one side and lawn on the other, the white pebbled path led to a brick and stone mansion. I crossed the threshold beneath French and American flags glittering side by side and hung my jacket on the rickety coat rack, breathing in the best smell in the world, a melange of the mossy scent of musty books and crisp newspaper pages. I felt as if I'd come home. So here she is for the interview. Oh, I think you're muted. You to be in the third <laughs> At least I'm not a cat. <laughs> People know what I'm talking about. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking about it. Um, I can't wait to read this book. I haven't had a chance yet, but I will. Um, so my question, my last question to you is what is next for you? What is next for me? Well, the book just came out. So this month, I think I have 30 interviews and events, and I'm just going to enjoy every minute. It's mm -hmm. been a long time. So <laughs> writing this book, so I'm just going to enjoy speaking to librarians and booksellers and readers. That's my plan. Well, that sounds like a really fun month. Um, but is there any kernel of a new book coming out yet? Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm always working on something, but I don't like to talk about it. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I just have to ask because, um, you know, inquiry minds. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this. This has been really wonderful. I feel very um, fortunate to have had this conversation with you and, you know, appreciate libraries and appreciate what librarians do, but also this craft with which you, you know, write your books is amazing. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you to Amanda for connecting us. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. Amanda Boucher, another author, connected us um, after one of our last programs. So um, just remember, you can buy signed books from Bank Square Books. I'll send, uh, I put the link in the chat, but I'll also send it in the recap with the, um, the link for the video. And um, uh, <laughs> I completely forgot what I was going to say. 
And thank you all for being here for this important conversation about this wonderful book. Um, we love historical fiction as well in Lexington. So this has been really nice. Um, so have a wonderful day, everybody. And thank you so much again for being here. Thank you, Janet. And thank you, Janet's parents. Yes, thanks, Mom and Dad. Thank you, Mina. Goodbye. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Thank you.